I'm your real father. And I just want you to know that I'm real. So hopefully that means something to somebody. <laughs> um, That's me. Yeah. I uh, usually share that with people that I share the Lord with or share the Lord with. In fact, I just spoke the same exact words to uh, my coworker, my partner uh, at work uh, on Friday. Um, and uh, we've been having good conversations. I usually stay after work and talk to him about God and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's really open. So, yeah, that's exactly what I tell him. And he's yeah. a real dude, you know. People yeah. need to know that. People need to be, you know, pounded with theology and the Bible. They just need to know that he's a person, that he's tangible, that he's real. He's, you know, he's he's a he's like a warm body, and mm -hmm. uh, he's he's capable, and we're capable of relationship with him. That's all people need to know. And once they know that, that just opens up the doors. That's yeah. all. Thanks. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. The um, one of the things I, I think often is uh, from where we stand depends on what we see. Um, you know, when you think about uh, God, you know, um, yeah, you can you can think in kind of like a natural term, like if you're standing on the uh, Atlantic coast, you know, you'll never see the sunset on the Pacific coast. You know, and, and vice versa. You know what? You know, physically determines what you see, but also um, where we stand. Uh, I guess theologically um, determines what we can see of God. The um, the interesting thing about uh, Harold's book, that uh, just general overview, is he he talks so much about our standard view of God. Uh, that we hear so much from so many churches from so many sources is actually all derived from the Greek culture, uh, not from the Bible itself, you know, not from the Hebraic culture. And so it, it kind of morphs things. Um, probably one of the big things right now that uh, I hear over and over again is uh, there's this huge gulf between God and us. There's this distance, you know, heaven is far, far away and so is God, and we have to pull heaven out. You know, there's all kinds of uh, different ways that's said, and none of that comes out of the Bible. You know, the, the scripture says God is near. God is very near. Um, so him saying, I am real. Uh, I am in heaven. Heaven is real. But heaven's not actually far away. It's very close. Um, so I think um, those are good things to help us see God more clearly. You know, God always takes us from what scripture says from glory to glory. You know, he, he builds truth line upon line, precept upon precept, you know, here a little, there a little, you know, so it's always growing. That's, that's true whether we're looking at scripture or in our life, you know, whether we're in our job, uh, we, we grow in, in just based on what we're, uh, what we've learned. So um, I think um, an interesting scripture that I actually didn't give um, Rebecca was Acts 1 1 and said, uh, the, um, here, let me read it. <laughs> Acts 1 1. Because my brain just went completely blank. I like the NIV, by the way, in case you're curious. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote all about, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. I, I, I find that very interesting. It was all about what Jesus began to do when they're starting the book of Acts, which to me says he's not done. You know, it, it didn't end at the book of Acts. You know, Jesus is still doing stuff. He's using you and I. And um, so it's important to look at God from uh, the correct perspective. <clears throat> so I like, um, like I said, 
about 900 pages thick. But what caught my attention was right in the introduction. And um, I can read it, though sometimes I'd like to be a reader. <laughs> um, there are four worldviews that Harold says the church kind of has. You know, they, and each one of those kind of determines the way we see life. So um, the first one he calls the salvation worldview. Salvation worldview just simply means that we start our worldview from Genesis 1, or Genesis, sorry, where Adam and Eve fell and their sin. So the salvation worldview says the way we start our life, the way we live our life is based on the sin problem. And there needs to be a solution for the sin problem. And that solution is Jesus, you know, his death. And that takes away our sin problem when we believe in him. And it says in the, the salvation worldview that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to convict people of sin so that we can get people saved, populate heaven. Um, that tends to shape, if, if, you, if we hold that particular view only, that shapes the way we look at God and the way we look at the world in the future. Uh, the second worldview, uh, Harold says, is the Pentecostal charismatic worldview, which pretty much starts from the same place. Adam and Eve sinned, we need a solution. Jesus is the solution. Um, but it goes and it adds, the Holy Spirit is here. And it was poured out by Jesus. And he baptized us. He gives us <clears throat> the, uh, the power to help people get saved, to see God. Uh, he fills us with joy still the same starting foundation of a sin problem. The, uh, the next worldview, Harold says, is the kingdom worldview. So the kingdom worldview starts at a slightly different foundation, still in Genesis, but it starts with the worldview that says, tend, keep the garden, subdue the earth. So it, it from there, you know, of course, it acknowledges that there is a sin problem and that we need Jesus. But the kingdom is what we focus on. So our, our task is to, uh, of course, help people know Jesus, get saved and everything. But we also need to expand the kingdom of God in whatever task God gives us. You know, whether it's uh, in a church, in a ministry, in a business like Lynn and I. Uh, you know, whatever task God's giving you, you know, that's where you expand the kingdom of God. And so it's um, just kind of that commission to subdue the earth um, for God's glory. But the, the, the fourth worldview, which uh, Harold says he believes is the most mature view, um, and that is the father son worldview. Um, father son doesn't start with Genesis. It doesn't start with sin. It doesn't start with the Great Commission of uh, to uh, you know not the Great Commission, but the Commission to you know subdue the world. And uh, it it actually starts more in uh, Ephesians four. Excuse me, Ephesians one four and five. So let me read that for you starts back before the creation. So Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So before the creation of the world, God thought of you and me. He thought of us and said, I want sons and I want daughters. So he thought of you and I. He dreamt about you and I. And he said, uh, 
They're my special ones. He predestined us to do task on the earth, but it all starts from our identity as sons and daughters, children of God. And that creates a totally different um, foundation. You know, I think, um, and these are my thoughts, not necessarily Harold's. Um, the salvation worldview and the um, Pentecostal charismatic worldview, you know, they start from the problem. So then we're always thinking about sin. What sin's done to the world? Why, you know, the, the bad things that's going on. And we're always focused on sin. And, and it creates this kind of sin consciousness. But um, that's not where God wants us to be. He wants us as sons and daughters. And then the, the kingdom worldview, you know, which is, is not wrong, but it's, it also focuses on uh, God gave us a task to do. We're supposed to go do this. We're supposed to go do that, expand, expand the kingdom of God, which is true. But if that's our foundation, then we start kind of getting into works. You know, I have to always do this. I have to work toward this, have to work toward that. But if you think from a child in a family, then, you know, as you grow up and to be more and more mature, then you say, well, yeah, the, the world has a sin problem, but my father's taking care of that through mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah, there are, there's tasks to do, but that's just what the family does. You know, we, we, we expand daddy's kingdom because he's, that's the family's business. You know, <laughs> I always like what Jesus said when he was 12, you know, did you not know I had to be about the father's business? You know, he's like, this is, this is the task. This is just what we do. We're, we, we have this family business, so that's what we do. We expand the kingdom of God. And it comes from a place of identity, not from a place of, I got to do this. I'm responsible for this. You know, it, it, that becomes a weight and a burden. Or if we actually know who we are, then that really sets us free to be a lot more effective. Um, so um, from there, I like to um, jump to this something that I believe God's releasing into the world right now. Maybe it's been released before. I've never heard of it, but it's, it's uh, Song of Solomon, chapter three. Mm -hmm. This one really captured my heart some time ago. And um, it, it really talks about this relationship um, with the Father. And it, it's, it goes like this. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I find that actually hilarious. How big was that bed <laughs> that you're looking all night long for the one you love? It says, I will get up now and go into the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they went about their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held on to him and would not let him go till I am brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who conceived me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse love. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. I kind of think God, the Holy Spirit, is at this place going like, it's time to be aroused to love to love God, to love the Father. So in um, father-son theology, we're, we're bringing sons and daughters into the kingdom, but we're also preparing a bride for Christ. You know, Revelation talks about the bride has made herself ready. So it's, it's that thing that I think we are being commissioned to, to pull, go into a deeper relationship with God. And um, if your heart is willing, 
if anyone's heart is willing, you know, we can awaken love. We can allow love to awaken because it's a deeper passion. Um, his choice. Um, I'll kind of end with, you know, a, a personal vision God gave me a long time ago. It may not mean anything to anybody else, but it meant a lot to me. You know, in the book of Revelation, where um, Jesus is described as the, uh, has the eyes of fire. Remember that? Head like wool um, and so forth. Um, but it, it, I was focusing on his eyes, you know, their eyes of fire. But have you ever seen two people madly in love with each other? Sometimes they just stare and gaze into each other's eyes and they can't, they don't care what else is going around. You know, they're just transfixed on each other and they're so deeply in love with each other. So the, this vision God gave me was, it was Jesus and his bride face to face staring at each other. Jesus had those eyes of fire, but the bride also had this passion, these eyes of fire staring at him. And this intensity of looking into each other's eyes, this love that they had for each other was so intense and so deep that in, in this little vision I saw, I could only see that for a moment and I actually had to turn away because of the intensity of this love. Um, but I think there are a people who want to have that passion for Jesus. And so, you know, it's, it's like the, the sower and the seeds. You know, you can get a 30-fold return, 60 or 100-fold. And it's just scriptures, it depends on how well you pay attention, how well we pay attention, what our passion is. And uh, any place we stop, it is totally okay, you know, because God loves us, we're his kids. But if we have a heart and a desire, we can move closer and closer and closer to him. Um, there, I believe there will be some who are destined to be the bride, whether they're destined or not, but they choose to be the bride. So um, that's kind of, uh, the, actually that's the introduction to father-son theology. Um, so, uh, yeah. So we're, I think that's probably somewhere around 15 minutes, so we can chat and see what y'all think. I am open for questions. I may not have answers. But Lynn's over here. She knows what I don't know. She knows what I don't know. I love how you said that. That's the introduction. I was ministering to somebody this week, and I had to give him a <laughs> show to ask theology. And I felt the same way. I'm like, well, there's your 15 minute intro. Here we go. <laughs> yeah 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 so what do you think guys new thoughts i think the the biggest thing that hinders people in a relationship with with papa god is that they did not a loving relationship with their own father or that there were problems with their with their relationship with their own father and so it plays right in why with seeing him as distant and authoritative and um, cold cold so whenever what I when when What's really interesting, what they do with Sozo, is they ask you how you, you view your relationship with each of the three parts of the Godhead. And if they're, if they're seeing there's a stumbling block in being able to really see or receive from, from each of them, then that's what they then work with. Because that's really what's preventing a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, from going further and really understanding God's heart is that they're still using 
their past relationships with men, um, father figures, um, authority figures, as being um, who they think God is like. And that's just absolutely false. That's not how God is. You know, we, we will run into people all throughout our lives that fail uh, for whatever reasons in being who they think they want to be. We can't judge Jesus or God or Holy Spirit because of those feelings. So I think that's the biggest thing when people really grasp God's heart, the Father's heart, and they know how much he loves us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know I don't want to turn my mic on, but um, when Tim told me what God had told him to tell everybody about um, that he is real, and I was thinking about what you're saying, Denise. It's like, what are the lies that have gotten in the way of our perception of who God is? And what do we need to um, be healed of? Or, um, you know, when we're deceived, we don't know we are. And the enemy is great at deceiving and throwing up um, walls, smoke screens, whatever you want to call it, lies. Um, just different ways that we look at God that aren't who he really is. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, I know you guys are, are starting to do Sozo stuff and that's awesome. We used to do that, um, six and seven years ago, I think, yeah. um, when we were up, up near you in St. Charles, Illinois. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah we, were, we were close. We used to be closer, <laughs> by golly. Anyways. <laughs> Way back. We used to live in Wheaton. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's where I'm from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lynn's family is originally from there. God brought her down here to meet me. Because <laughs> I need her. her. Get back. What? Just kidding. <laughs> well, we were there for 13 years. And yeah. um, I wanted to read something um, from Colossians <clears throat> chapter one. Um, this is the Passion translation. Um, starts in verse 26, there is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but now is being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy <laughs> believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people, and God wants everyone to know it. Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity with his power flowing through me to present every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ that revelation of being his perfect one. That's how God mm -hmm. sees you as his perfect one in Jesus Christ. That just really stood out to me this morning. Doesn't that hit some of your hearts abrasively? Like, can't you just feel it? Like, what? Perfect? Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can hear it in the spirit. There's some of this like screeching to a halt, like, ah, his perfect one. So take a moment and focus on that and ask God if there's a lie you're believing about him. You know, Denise said, you know, it's like, how do you vision God? How do you vision the Father? And, and if the vision you see doesn't bring you hope, doesn't fill you with joy and love and all the things that the kingdom of God is, then maybe there's a new revelation of God that you need, you know? Yeah, what I'm kind of hearing in that statement was that it's kind of like Gideon when the Lord approached him, when God approached him and said, mighty warrior, when he's hiding like a chicken in the wine press. <laughs> yeah. And some of us are like, uh, I don't look so perfect today. And he's calling you out to your destiny, saying exactly who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. Oh, yeah. he's got his hand up. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's um, it's been challenging for me most of my life because I was raised in a Baptist church that actually made God seem like a huge disciplinarian. And, uh, you know, like God gave me a blueprint of a bulletproof marriage like you were talking about, you know, the kingdom uh, mindset of how to subdue the earth for God's glory. But um, one of the major challenges has been to be able to see God as a, and it says in Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, to believe in him, we have to believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And it's been a hard battle for me to see God as a rewarder, you know, because uh, to see myself as, okay, so it's not based on performance, it's based on the relationship, you know, and here our parents, are, we as parents and our parents were supposed to actually raise us up to know who God was so that we can get to the age of emancipation. We can say, okay, well now God is so much a father to me my father was there for me. My mom was there for me, but they're supposed to, I'm now they're passing me on to where now all my wisdom I'm supposed to get from the father. You know, I'm supposed to go directly to him. My parents are, you know, I can still ask them stuff. I can still get, you know, get suggestions from them and stuff, but basically God is supposed to be the one that's leading me in everything. And uh, that's been a hard transition because I was raised in such a, you know, God is such a disciplinarian. I thought the rod and the staff were both to beat the crap out of you. I didn't know the rod, the staff. I knew the, well, they would say the rod's supposed to beat off like the wolves and stuff, but I thought that was also used on me as well. And I didn't realize the staff was to help the sheep, you know, that was out of reach to be able to get good footing so they could get out of the area they got themselves into. And uh, so I always thought he was just so much against me, you know, and because my father was. So, yeah, that's been a huge um change and it didn't start to for me it didn't even start until age 45 46 i mean i had to throw away almost everything that i learned all the way up to about age 46 about god and that's so basically you know i'm still like a child right now in christ because you know i'm i'm like uh seven years old now <laughs> yeah so what you said steve i want to actually highlight something i think it's really important because of our direction and we're a group of people. I'm almost, I'm calling you like a launch team. Okay. You guys are a tribe of people about to release something into the earth. I see it being ready to birth. And it, this is a really crucial concept. Look at the four worldviews that Tim just presented. Two of them are sin focused. And another one is task focused. So what do we kind of write up against a lot? is why aren't you looking at your sin and why aren't you do, 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 go, 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 strive? So we have this religion um, sin focus. We've got this task-oriented striving. That is three of the four worldviews. And so when we're presenting, the worldview that I have, that I personally have, that I get a lot of questions about and or misunderstandings where people don't understand me. They literally don't understand me is that I have a father-son worldview, I'm starting at the solution, right? And so when I'm, I'm speaking to you guys about we bring heaven solutions, it's not about calling out what's wrong. It's not about pointing out and highlighting um, what's wrong with the world, how we're not measuring up. We, like I said last week, we know that we are not always doing the thing, right? That we don't always hit it every time, but God calls us his perfect ones. And so it's my job to call out the perfection that's in you. And it's my job to call out the gold that's in you. The more you draw out somebody's identity, the more you draw out the gold that's inside of them, the more you call out their, who they are, the more you start at the solution, the less they're going to have of these three worldviews. Like the worldview you have is the worldview you will walk in. And so we've got this pervasive sin focus thing because it's app of all the worldviews it's half of that is sin focus i mean that really stood out to me and that's why we have to repent from our old mindsets right now to lay down because god this is the work for this year that that nathan had wrote out in december you know you have to lay down or let go of to be able to lay hold of this amazing relationship that god wants to show us this year so i really feel like that is a key point to really grab and understand. And some of you who have even been like questioning, that's the thing right there, starting at the solution. 
I really feel like Tim brought together some of the the things that that we even have dissonance on, even in our own tribe here. Um, so I really wanted to draw that out. I know Nathan wants to speak, and then Chris. So we'll go with Nathan next. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear you? Okay. Um, as you were saying that, I, I kept just getting the vision, and then um, Rebecca, you kind of confirmed it. Um, I, I kept seeing a mining this whole time. Like we're mining. Like you're in that cave, you're in the crevice, you're in the wherever you're mining from and you're pulling out the precious gems and the ores and the gold. And uh, Rebecca, when you said you get to drag out the gold or to pull that out, to me, for me, this is like, I, I, I know that I have an issue where I can't see God in all the beauty that he has and like this, his like amazing love for us because I, I'm viewing him as I view myself instead of viewing him as I, I, I should be seeing him when all he is. Instead, I draw it back into where I'm at in the worldly view of what I have of like, well, God says he's this, but I'm not feeling that right now. So your feelings, God, are not valid. My feelings are valid. What you're telling me is not valid. What I'm feeling about myself is valid. And so I feel like this has taught me like dig deeper, find that gold in there and be like, this is where God is saying, believe that he is saying this and not put my own thoughts of who I feel I am in that moment and project that on God and say, God, you're this right now. So if I'm feeling down and low, something didn't go right. It's like, God, this is you. You have the same feeling and this is what we're doing together. But God's like, no, <laughs> that's not it. You, you've got a, um, a wrong viewpoint on, on who I am. So that was really good because that makes me want to dig more for gold in those mines. Cause you don't know what you're going to find in there for me personally. Anyway, I won't know what I find until I actually start digging into it. So thank you. Wow. That was huge. What you just said, Nathan, cause I hear a lot about like we view God um, through the lenses of our relationships on earth. Right. Like a lot of times people view the father kind of in the scope of, or they, they superimpose the scope of their own experience with their earthly father onto our heavenly father. This is, this is unique. I haven't heard it like this before, but it's so resonated with me is I'm viewing God as I'm viewing myself. So if I'm looking at myself in an improper way and I'm looking through those lenses and seeing God in that way, that was really huge. What you said, I would really, I want to draw that out because if we could think about it for a minute, like actually think about that and not just let that little, that point just go away, but actually say, ask ourselves, am I viewing God through the lens of the way I'm even viewing my own self? I've had to well, take time throughout my day to do that. Yeah. I have, when I've, when I've gotten to like a really dark place or a deep place, that's just I'm like, this doesn't feel right. And I'm like, God, I'm speaking to you. Where are you? And then I realize. Well, I'm not really speaking to God. I'm speaking to myself, thinking I'm speaking to God. And he's there listening. He's like, you got it all wrong there, son. Let's uh, readjust for a little bit. So yeah, I, I, I have found myself having to do that. I don't, I'm catching it more. And it's not every time, but I'm catching it a lot more. Yeah. Interesting. That was really good. You know, it was, it was, I found this interesting reaction in my heart when you were talking a little while ago. And you said we need to repent. Um, and part of my old mindset, you know, when I hear the word repent means, oh, there's sin that I've got that I have to get rid of. And, uh, I, I like the, uh, the other definition of repent, which is just to change your mind, you know, to think That's different. That's exactly what I guess. Yeah. So when we, when we repent, we're just changing the way we think, the way we, we view things. Um, and, um. Uh, there was this, um, somebody said something, I forget who it was, but it's like, it reminded me of this scripture. It's like, you know, it says where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And, you know, most of the times in church, I've heard that preach, you know, oh, we need to have our, our hearts set on God, our hearts set on heaven. But my thinking is, where is God's treasure? You know, where is God's heart? You know where your heart is there where your treasure is there your heart will be also i think we are his treasure you know the scripture says that in lots of places we are his treasure therefore his heart 
is on us and surrounds us and things like that. So that's it's a whole new mindset. Um, and I, I think that's a great way to go. It helps, it helps so much to be able to see how much the Father loves us and um, the position that we're in. You know, like you were talking about covenant last week and uh, last, two weeks ago, whenever, last week. And um, that's so true. You know, we are in a really, really good place. We're in the family. Once you're in a family, you, you don't get kicked out. You know, you're, you're always family. You can withdraw yourself, but, you know, you can't, you know, be legally be kicked out. So uh, come on. that's a good place to be. And that's a good thing to, to think and ponder on it. it. When we do that, it starts changing our hearts. I think it really does. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for that authenticity there. Uh, that is something I, I think it's to even teach the principle behind what you did, because I said the word repent and immediately something in you went, you know, and then what you did is said, why am I feeling that? And can I look at it in a different perspective? And then what you did was actually pull out the healthy version of repent means I'm going to change my mind and walk in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And it is to take the lies we're believing and to change our mind about them and operate in the truth. It's as simple as that. I love what you did there. And I just actually want to highlight that you did that because I think that's a skill that all of us can really glean from and learn to adapt that was that was really well done thank you so much for that i really appreciate it you're welcome yeah i think chris did you have something to say sir did i say chris i think chris had it yeah. i saw yeah. a thing okay thank you <laughs> um i'm going to use something that steve says quite a bit um, and I don't, and I, in some, in some ways, I think this has kind of come cliche with some of us uh, because he says it quite a bit and I don't, and it's just taking me recently to find out what this means is that basically we are, we are the righteousness of God. God, when God looks at us, he sees us with, through Jesus lens. He sees Jesus in us. So that helps when let's say the enemy comes along or it starts beating you up. Oh, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. It helps to remember God doesn't see that anymore. If we have Holy spirit in us, God doesn't see that, you know? So I mean that everything that was said the past couple minutes here is, is awesome. Cause it just, uh, that's what it is. It's repentance. It's and repentance is not a bad word. It's actually a very, very holy word a very good word because it's all it is is a mindset change and that's all we need through our battles so um yeah that's all i really wanted to say i just didn't want to take up too, your time, too much of your time here actually what you just said chris is really good um the way we can receive that better is when we begin to understand the covenant that we're in yeah Exactly. And that's something we're going to be pursuing a little more boldly in this, this upcoming season here. So um, thank you for that. You're exactly right. You can say it like a hundred times. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that mean? And how do we, how do we really do you, onto that? How do you, how do you yeah. How do you apply that? That's the key is that I think people are, they know that they know it up in here, you know, which is swims in your head, but you really don't know. Okay, what do I do with this? That's all. What does that mean? And the covenant. Once you understand the covenants, you are in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So once yeah. you understand God's purpose and goodness all the way through the Bible. Oh, yeah. Scripture, exactly. That's when you really understand that verse. So, yeah. That he's love. He, all his plans for us are good. All his thoughts toward us are good. So once we understand that, shh, let's do it. You know, let's go. Absolutely. Wow. I, I have a lot to say on this topic, too. And first of all, I really wanted to say I'm proud of each of you being very authentic today. That means we are getting the most out of this discussion because you're being real with what your struggle is right now. This is where the opportunity is is to catch these things when they're happening. I guarantee you right now, any battle that you find yourself in, who's just hearing this just straight from God, 
any battle that you're in right now, the solution is in how you see God. And this, this theology part of it, seeing yourself as that child of his, his precious one, changes everything about the circumstance you're in. It's knowing that heaven's solutions are right there with you. Now, I have battles in my life right now, too, and I'm, I'm, I'll open up about this part of how I see God the Father and who he truly is, that he wants the absolute best for me and not seeing like this sin focus. There are parts of even my upbringing that I heard it so much, it became a part of how I think. And then just like what Tim was saying is like, oh, that word repents. Oh my goodness, that causes this reaction inside of me what's going on, how do I respond to that, is it begins with a thought of that is against myself. It's sabotaging me because I'm thinking about my mistake, my whatever the thing is that I just did wrong. And now it becomes all about that instead of the solution. And the solution is who God made me to be. I simply choose to step into who God made me to be. And I already know what that is. It's to be his son. It's to be just thankful and grateful for who he is, not for what he can give to me, but just for who he is. And now my worldview is completely transformed. I, I heard things from each one of you about like it's really our challenge is in those worldviews. If, if there's those two that are based on the religion aspect, they're not leading us well. So we catch it. We catch the thought right when it happens and choose to, to shift it to the father-son worldview. I believe there are action steps for each one of us right now. Choose what your action step is going to be to catch those faulty worldviews and shift them to father son in that would anybody like to share now that we've unveiled four worldviews here has, has anything from those worldviews stood out to you um, that you'd like to share personally that you, you are wanting to apply or walk out of or walk into, or maybe it helped you to understand something better. I'd love to hear from some of you about that. I, I feel personally that I've lived with all four of them. Yep. <laughs> yeah, me too. I feel like I mean, I can literally see, yeah, I went through that one. The truth is, is grasping how the Father sees us, you know, how our Father really sees us, the bad we thought we were through the world, what we, and I think to be, I heard a line, that it will take all of eternity to truly understand the depth of his love. For us. And I really believe that's true. Like, it just keeps blowing me away the more I um, grasp that. You know, when you truly grasp that, um, all the other stuff just doesn't get better anymore. And it's so great when you can just kind of let all those other, like, false doctrines and, and old belief systems just peel away and fall away. And you just feel like you're, you know, so free. So, yeah. It's good. Really, thank you for sharing this, Tim. You're welcome. I think um, one of the things I do, just have been a habit for a long time, as I 
re, you know, when something grabs my attention, so let's say, you know, who we are in Christ uh, or how God thinks about us as I, as I read through scriptures, um, sometimes, you know, I'll hit a certain scripture that says, oh, you, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, or you are my treasured possession, or um, you are a king, a priest. You know, I, I stop at those, and sometimes I'll underline in my Bible, sometimes I'll write notes, but sometimes it's just, just pondering, okay, what is God actually saying here about me and just not rushing through it, because sometimes you're like, oh, I got to read my five chapters today, or or whatever, you know, we we do. But um, there's, you know, our habit is to get up in the morning, have coffee in bed, and and read the read our scriptures and talk to God for about a half an hour or so. And um, yeah, sometimes I'll I'll read one verse and I'll just stay there and ponder it because it's speaking so deeply to my heart, and. Um, that helps, I think. It helps me anyway, you know, to to think about who I really am in Christ and what he's really done and how he has transformed me. Um, and I I think that's probably not a bad idea. You know, you can person can do it any which way they want, journal, whatever. But I think that's that's very helpful. So it's 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 good to realize those things, like you're talking about, Denise. Any other thoughts on worldviews? I'll carry on with what Rebecca said. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, one of the things that um, you know I learned a few years ago that I put together was uh, there are seven, like talking about the fact of repentance. Okay, there's there are seven specific um, mercies. You know, when in Lamentations three, when it says that you know the mercies of God are new every morning seven different mercies that actually we have available every day. And I think people may know them, you know, like two or three of them or something like that. But I think when you put them all together, it's really amazing because the first one being the fact of repentance, there's never an end to repentance. It's 24 seven every day. It's brand new every day. It never runs out. Um, if I realize that God is so much for me and I am for me that who can be against me, then that fact of repentance is absolutely amazing. You know, the fact of uh, what God has, uh, has given us, the fact that um, we get 300 million brand new brain cells every day and we lose 300 million brain cells. And tomorrow, as long as I teach my brand new brain cells new information about who God is, my mind will change over a period of time. That's just, it's, it's an amazing, that's a physiological mercy that God has given us. We don't have to stay with all the thoughts, the old thoughts and all the old um uh, belief systems we used to have and it is about changing belief system so it's amazing what he's done for us that most people still don't realize or a lot of people anyway in church specifically still don't realize what's available to us and you know it's like the the whole thought process of i'm a sinner if that if i'm believing that specifically i'm a sinner i'm a sinner i'm a sinner I'm actually completely against what God actually says about me. How can I expect not to get attacked? That's just the crux of it. You know, it's like, if I got that mindset, how can I actually think I can ever please God? Because my mindset is actually, how can I fail him? And that's a part of a belief system that has to change to be able to get to that place of saying, Hey father, you know, you're my father. You, you, you know, everything that's in me, you know, you actually, before I ever stepped on this earth, you designed, you know, that design is absolutely flawless. And I'm coming back to that design as, and I want to be intentional about seeing myself the way you see me. That's a change in belief system that'll actually work for us. So yeah, it's incredible. I was, I mean, amazing everything he's done for us. And you know, we'll sit and listen to somebody else all day long and say, do they think we say God, God says we are? But I've got to believe it myself. I've got to know, hey, this is exactly who he says. I'm his son, the same way Jesus was his son, the same way Adam was his son, the same way Abraham was his friend. You know, in, in Hebrews 2, it says that Jesus came to make all of us brothers and sisters. And 
you know, I used to, I used to be afraid to say the name of Jesus in the Baptist church. I thought that that was heresy. I thought people were going to strike me down or God was going to strike me down just for saying the name Jesus. So yeah, it's, it's pretty wild how, man, just, just religion and just saying, Hey, you know, you have to see God in this way is, is detrimental. Something I was thinking about when we were talking about was um, the whole woke thing that's going on in the world. It's almost like, um, I what I wrote down. it seems that the woke thinking is a sin conscious view on steroids. They're parroting the lies of the enemy, bringing condemnation, speaking loudly the voice of the enemy. And I was just thinking, what's our response to that? And and just like, maybe pray for them to have a revelation of who the Father is, and that would change their their anger and their um their wrong view about life and things. I don't know. Just it's huge. It's what we look at all the time, you know, on the news. And it's like, what what's our response to that? You know. Mm-hmm. Well, you're right, Lynn, because it's a counterfeit, absolute counterfeit, and. I was just sharing this with Rebecca the other day, you know, the, the, the distraction, the diversion, the deception, we all know the deception is, you know, the, the antichrist spirit wants to bring around everything, all this kind of stuff, you know, to be against Christians. But the thing is the distraction aspect, what they're doing, what they're saying they're doing as they're doing, uh, saying that they, you know, they're saying they want to end slavery but everything they're doing is actually creating fear, which in turn is creating a victim mentality, which actually in turn is creating a, a mental slavery to that same exact fear. So they're actually putting in fear into action, what they say they're trying to take away. And then the divert, the diversion aspect of it is the fact that we take that and we actually receive that victim mentality. And then we receive that slavery mentality that, oh my gosh, now we have to demean ourselves so that somebody else has greater value. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we, if we, if you really want to go about value, let's say, okay, we all have the same value because we're all created in Christ because we all are designed and evolution has actually taken away that has taken away that, um, sorry, um, value. Because if I wasn't made or created by anything and I just popped into existence, then I actually have no value except for what somebody sees in me or I see in myself. And it's like, yeah, the amazing part is all this, it, the lies, the lies are actually trying to say, well, we see it, but we see it with a lot of people in high places that are doing the exact same things or blaming somebody else for, which is all manipulation, control, deception, all these kind of things. And yes, just just like you were saying, I have actually had to force myself to say, okay, God, you love every one of these people, you know, because the covenant we're under right now is between Jesus and and God. The covenant says Jesus, God loves the world so much that he sent Jesus and this covenant is between him and God. And we enter into that covenant and they haven't. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is, but the covenant for, for all of us is not for a nation, it's for the people in a nation and once they get into that covenant, they can actually change a nation. Exactly. So, yeah, they're all our brothers and sisters, even though they're acting badly. And, you know, it's, it's the thing is, when Jesus, when, when God said specifically, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love others as yourself, it, that actually says we have to learn to love ourselves the way God loves us. But then through that, we have to learn to love the other people the way God loves us or the way God wants to love them. And we have to come into the agreement that they have that value that God's given them. That's, uh, you know, you can't be a narcissist with that. (laughs) That's like the the antidote to narcissism. (laughs) Yeah, so I think that the word today I want to draw this out because I think it applied to what Lynn was saying um it's time to arouse love when you hear that statement what did that mean to you guys yeah 
I see a, a real depth of awakening. I believe that the, the revival that is coming is a revelation of what his love actually means. Of, um, it's like the, the worldviews that we were talking about earlier, they expose themselves when we experience God's love. See, what, what we actually have experienced has become our reality. You know, a, um, a traumatic past can become something that overtakes a person. And then they are focused on those circumstances and those difficult times, the things that they're battling. It really becomes mindsets, mindsets to protect or to feel offended. There's a lot of feeling that happens in it. But I... I I see that the solutions in this are all about how we are seeing God, how we are awakened to his love. I, like, I saw the partnership between, um, Lynn, when you shared that verse from, um, from Ephesians first, and then um, also we were looking at, at Song of Solomon, it's like that that is the the choice of the father son worldview I, it it's it's that we're saying we are his precious ones we have the opportunity to awaken ourselves to his love that that's fully available like there's nothing in between us like we it's only stuff we've put there <laughs> like um by our our own experience and then we place God in a place he never intended to be. So we, we choose to remove those barriers by changing how we think, changing how we view him. I think what's, what I found is interesting is many times things we believe very deeply are the very first things we were taught when we came to Christ. Um, it's 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 really stunning, you know. Um, you know, we're a brand new Christian. Uh, a pastor, our friend, says this thing. You know, true or not true, um, we go like, oh, okay, they're they're my mentor. That must be true. And those truths, the, those words, sink into our heart and they lock in a certain thing um, uh, that sometimes we have to dig down and figure out why they're locked there and, and then change that. So it's like this, you know, so, so, so amazing for breaking through lies and deceptions and things like that. But uh, I, I have discovered that, you know, like things that somebody said in passing that I greatly respected. They may have had no scriptural basis for it, but they just said it because they believed it. Yet I was a baby in Christ and therefore I took it in and it held this place in my heart until all of a sudden I go like, oh, wait a minute. I don't see that in scripture. As a matter of fact, I see other scriptures contrary to that. And then you have to uproot that. And it, it does tend to um, develop roots in us. You know, if you think about a plant, it just kind of becomes like almost this weed that um, chokes out the, the better things in life. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to kind of pay attention to our thoughts and they're they're hard to do but you know having a discussion like this is helpful for everybody kind of like oh look this is what i'm believing yeah yeah i don't know how to get rid of it but i believe it <laughs> <laughs> you know there, there are examples in this tim of exactly what you're saying it's like i'm having this experience and then i realize something is going on in my thoughts i'm just going to throw one out here i think we all can relate to is, oh my goodness, there is a financial burden that I wasn't prepared for. And it is coming right up in front of me and now I gotta deal with this. And I, I feel like God is not my provider right now. I feel like this is hurting me. I feel powerless in this situation. It's all, that's how I'm responding. That's how I feel. But the truth does not change that he is my provider and he is finding a solution. He's already on it and he loves me enough. He's already pointing me to a solution. 
right when that thing hits. He already has a backup plan, a solution, things that I could never come up with myself. And all I do is choose to partner with him in it. I, instead of going to the lack of he's not my provider, that's a lie. It's an yeah. absolute lie. And so that's just one example, right? Uh, and when yeah. the thinking comes up, when I feel a certain way, what am I going to do about that? So it, as Steve was saying, it's these belief systems. It's all the way to that root of a belief system. I know that. He is my provider. I just look in the past. Oh my goodness. I, the things I've gone through, look at how God carried me through it. Mm -hmm. and Steve, I see you got your hand up there. Yeah. One thing, you know, we've been saying a little bit about this over the last few weeks, but the one main thing is, is at this point in time, like Lynn was talking about, right? The things that they're doing. The thing is more than now than ever for people who are prepared and actually know they're, they're emotionally strong. They see who God is. They, the, you know, the last 10 years where God was saying, here, I want you to see yourself through my eye. Um, for people who really want to do things and be a, be a, a, uh, a catalyst for change, right now is the time because we can be on the offensive because every time something comes up, it gives us a target of what the enemy's doing. These things used to be hidden. These things used to be where we couldn't see them, didn't realize they were going on. And we were on the defense of basically, you know, just trying to keep ourselves protected. But the issue is right now, it's the time for actually the church to be on the offensive. And like Lynn was saying, speaking about those people's lives, most of our offensive plays are gonna be through intercession. They're gonna be through, let's get an agreement with what God's doing. Let's get an agreement with what he's saying, what his heart is for people. We have to understand his heart for us in order to be in that place where we can actually declare his heart over other people. This 10 years is a time when we're supposed to be able to speak, prophesy into the things that God wants to do. Every time the enemy does shows his face through somebody else or some action or something or through the, the digital currency, all this kind of stuff, we're supposed to be able to say, hey, no, that's not God's heart for that. God's not wanting to, to bring that about. Enemy, you can't pass this place like we were talking about Gandalf, you know, in that um, in that cave where he says, no, you cannot pass. Right now is an amazing time in history for the church to stand up and intercede in the way of being offensive. Uh, I'm sorry, offensive, not offensive. <laughs> uh, well, it will, be off, it will be offensive because it's going to be truth. Because truth is offensive to people. But so being offensive and actually saying, okay, God, what is your heart for this? How do you see this? What do you want, what do you want me to declare out of my mouth that's in agreement with me? That, that's, we're supposed to release on earth what has been released in heaven and bind on earth what has been bound in heaven. This is an amazing time for the body of Christ in unity to stand up. And we've got all the reason because now we're being pressured. And like this, like this cup, you know, I have to put some pressure on this cup in order to be able to move this cup around, pick it up, move it to my mouth. I can't not put pressure on this cup and expect me to be able to take a drink. You know, we're, we're going through some things right now, which are actually amazing. And I do believe that God's trying to show his church through the sonship aspect of what God wants to do and through, uh, and through um, the kingdom um, mindset, you know, that actually says that, Hey, God's absolutely for me. And now I'm going to be for me. It's an amazing time in history. We just can't listen to all the crap that's coming up saying, you can't do this. You can't do that. This is going to happen. We can't listen to all the prophetic guys saying that all the crap is going to happen and believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got to say about that. <laughs> Good job. Eve, um, there was something you said in there that like this really hit me well. As you were talking about, it's the power of the intercession and how that goes for it. Literally, things are shifting immediately as those words are, are released. And it's see, it's a power of blessing. See, in our intercession, we're blessing. We're not cursing stuff, right? We're, we're blessing that situation, that person, whatever it is. 
just allowing God's truth, the truth of who God is to be released into that situation. And it has hope and life on it as it's released and things will change. <laughs> it's just like, there's so much hope on it. Um, and if and that, that's what we're in. <laughs> if we're cursing something, we have to look and say, who am I actually in agreement with? That's right. I mean, I can be a Christian and say, oh, well, God, take them all out. Well, God told, uh, you know, the disciples after the Mount or after the uh, mountain ex experience, you know, and says, hey, wait a minute, you don't know what what spirit you're of when they said they want to draw, uh, draw or uh, bring down fire on the people who are trying to do what they should be doing. Right. And they were actually they're they're intentional about it, saying, we'll we'll bring down fire because they're actually healing people. They're doing these things. And he said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. That's the point. Yeah. When we go into these mindsets, what spirit are we of? Are we in the agree with the enemy? Or are we agreeing with the Father? And that's what the whole life here on, on planet Earth is about. Yeah, Tim, I, I love this subject. I was, I'm just so glad that you're able to bring this message today. And I, I see so much life and hope on how we can respond to it. I, it's just so much potential. I didn't even realize that it could be tied to this stuff. It's foundational stuff. I feel like this is where the root of a lot of how we are living today is based on that worldview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it does impact everything. So like I said in the beginning, where we stand determines what we see. So if we're standing on the Father and the Son worldview, if we're standing in the love of Christ and you know in the the covenant that He's established, um, then we're we're safe and we see things differently. You know, it's um, we see the Father correctly. We our glasses, you know, we're not wearing uh, rose color glasses or whatever color glasses that change what we see. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very important to get our foundation correct. Um, I, small story, probably 10 years ago, I was at a lady's house measuring for floors and, uh, she was, um, oh, I don't know, probably in her seventies. She's a, I'll, I'll call her a little Lutheran lady because, you know, my back then, you know, I didn't think, God was involved in Lutherans necessarily, <laughs> you know, bad as that thought was. But as I was talking to her, I became very envious of her. She had this personal relationship with Jesus that as she spoke, you could just see her love and her passion for Jesus. And it's just, it just kind of flowed out of the pores of her body. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want that. You know, you know, she's not charismatic like me, you know, <laughs> but, you know, she's, she's Lutheran. I'm like, oh my gosh, how does she get that? How did she fall so passionately and deeply in love with Jesus? And uh, it, it starts something, I mean, that, you know, we can, we can have that. And um, I think as we fall in love with Jesus and, and um, we see him and we're, we're watching him and then all of a sudden, um, well, you know, like the book of Acts says in, in Antioch, they were first called Christians. You know, Christ is the anointed one. You know, Christians are anointed. You know, they, they look like Christ. They sound like Christ. They do what Christ did. They're, they're anointed to do what Jesus did. And all the people of the city started going like, wait a minute, we see Jesus coming out of their pores and let's call them Christians. And uh, wouldn't it be fun if uh, Freeport was known for, oh, this is where the real Christians are. Because, you know, Jesus just comes out of their pores, the, the love, the power of God just flows out of everybody. And that makes people envious. <laughs> like, I want that, I want that. Where do you, you know, I've had people like, where do you go to church? <laughs> you know. 
So it's, uh, it, it can be very, very contagious, which uh, it's, it is standing on the right place. So if we, we stand in the place where we're preaching condemnation, people are like, yeah, yeah, I get enough of that. I don't, I don't really want to hear that. Yeah. But we can, be, we can be the new woke. <laughs> we can be the new woke. <laughs> You're talking about being awakened. <laughs> no, yeah, well, well, we're woke to Christ. We're woke to the kingdom. We're woke to the Father, and uh, it, it's all good. It's all good. Hey, Tim, there was a, a point you were saying in here about, um, you know, hey, this this lady, she's Lutheran. All, all of a sudden, it's like I wasn't expecting this. Yeah, you know yeah. what that is, and and I I will own this as well too. Is there's this unconscious bias that's running behind the scenes that has to do with a person of a particular faith and so forth. You know, for a season, we had a young man really passionate for God who came and helped us with drumming. He'd, he'd come and, and, you know, serve with us and stuff. He was never considered a member, but he kind of came along and, and did some stuff with us. Oh my goodness. The guy is like on fire. He loves God. He's you know, he's, he's got the, you know, some other roots and some things going on, but he really stands out in how active he is in the community and stuff. And I want to see people who have a heart and a passion like that. I feel that, see, revival is in removing all that bias and being able to see, hey, this is another human being who is learning to walk with God wherever they are. I honor who they are, who God made them to be, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do with this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, oh my goodness, I am on fire with excitement on what God is doing. You see that passion rise up? That's the, that's the key is that they're ready to step into what God has for them, just giving them some truth to walk through those, those steps, whatever is standing in the way of them understanding their identity in God. Mm -hmm. yeah all right so looking at time what i would really love to do is um wrap up if you tim especially you do you have some what are your final words just kidding <laughs> uh, if you could actually recap your teaching and just give it hey this is what we talked about today this is what got highlighted kind of do a, a close of your message for us so we can wrap it together. We'll take some final comments. Um, yeah, and then uh, we'll move into the next part of our service. Okay. Recap, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> but I think um, <clears throat> just remembering who we are in Christ, and understanding that there are different worldviews in the church, you know, and they're not wrong. Uh, they're actually, I believe, steps, you know, to moving towards Christ. Uh, each one can, you know, we can go from step to step to step very easily. It doesn't have to take years. But um, maybe taking some time um, and just see what our heart says, you know, I'm more in this worldview, I'm more in that worldview, uh, I'm more in the charismatic worldview, I'm more in the kingdom worldview, or the father and son worldview, and then if, you know, if there's this place in our heart goes like, you know, I'm here, but I want to be there, you know, start talking to God, like, how do I, how do I move into the fullness for what you have for me, and I think maybe that's the, the heart of this message, it's to create freedom in our hearts, freedom that uh, will bring us to the place of just knowing daddy and being a, a free child to run and play and jump in the presence of God and not be concerned about um, really anything except being his. <laughs>